Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to introduce Brigadier General Gal Hirsch to deliver the 2012 ADC Gandal Oration. Can you please join me in welcoming Gal to the stage? Thank you, John. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, distinguished guests. It is my honor and privilege to be here with you. Australia is always a good place to visit, and I always feel among friends and family here. For me, the words personal and national is just the same. I served my country, as described before, since I was 14 years old. And the decision was made, actually, during my Bar Mitzvah day, when, after climbing on Masada Cliff, as a tradition of all the teenagers in the Negev, in Judea Desert, my family were pioneers, and they established Arad, a new settlement in the Negev. Our tradition was, during the Bar Mitzvah event, to climb up the Masada Cliff. Put my tefillin at the ancient synagogue of the Jewish rebellers that fought against the Romans. And after leaving the cliff back home, usually there was the music and the tables and the speeches. But we couldn't make it. Down the cliff, there was the official IDF delegation that told us that a few hours ago, my cousin, Amnon, was a pilot in the Israeli Air Force, and he was killed in action. There was no bar mitzvah event, no celebrations, no speeches, no tables, no music. We were all running to the funeral. And after seven days of mourning, I found myself in the recruiting agency of Bir Sheva, the closest big city to Arad, asking to recruit the military academy to pass the screening process and to follow Amnon's footprints, to take the torch and to continue. And I was lucky to be among a few <coughs> dozens that make it to start to pass the screening process and to be among small group of cadets. And since that day, when I was 14 years old, as mentioned before I started my service, well, everything was under fire. Everything was under fire. When I first became a soldier fighter, a power trooper, after a few weeks, I found myself in the airport of Beirut in Lebanon under fire, and that was the first Lebanon war. Many years later, I commanded the 91st Division against Hezbollah inside Lebanon. That was the second Lebanon war. And as we can all feel, according to what happens in the Middle East, in this special neighborhood, who can tell me that there will not be a third Lebanon war? So everything was under fire. Everything. And along the years, I had to build family. And I just urged early this morning teenagers from Mount Scorpus School and asked them to visit Israel, to go and serve in the IDF, and to make Aliyah. And one of the reasons I tried to give them a good reason to do so is that in the Israeli Defense Forces, you may find your wife or husband. I did it very successfully. Everything was by the rules, of course. But I found Donna when I was a cadet in the Israeli Defense Forces, in the officer training school, and I had to build family and bring children. 
My elder daughter just left Australia a few weeks ago after traveling here. She's an officer in the Israeli Defense Forces as well. And her name is Ori, my source of light in Hebrew. <coughs> Ofri is almost 18 years old and she is going to recruit the army in 10 months. And she is now passing screening process to serve in elite units in Israel. And the little one, Neil, she is 10 years old, but she behaves like an officer right now. <laughs> she gives us orders, and we all obey. So during these years, a family of a warrior, of a soldier, needs to live in a very strange way of life. As mentioned before, I was a platoon leader, company commander, unit commander, battalion commander, special forces commander, brigade commander, division commander. And all along these years, it was all under fire. There were many tragic events, many traumatic memories. And Donna, my wife, my brave wife, was running from the battalion back home and from home to the battalion. And the battalions were always in the front. It was along the Lebanese border or the Jordan Valley or the Egyptian border or Gaza Strip or Judah and Samaria. And we made Passover nights in the Kasbah of Nablus and we celebrate Rosh Hashanah near the border under Katyusha rockets. This is how people sacrifice when they understand their mission. This is not a career. I never treated my life as a career soldier. It is a privilege. I'm honored to serve my country, my nation, my people. And uh, somehow the year passed and I look back and I say, wow, it was really something that looks like a career, but I never treat myself as a career soldier or a professional. I'm just leading, leading and saying the Israeli IDF motto, follow me, or as Gideon, the judge, told us in the Bible, watch me and do likewise. Just do what I'm doing and follow my footprints. One of the big traumatic memories for my family was this well-prepared Islamic Jihad ambush that targeted me. They tried many times. That day, 12 years ago, they actually succeeded almost completely succeeded. I was badly injured in that ambush north to Ramallah, and uh, I was sent back to hospital two months under intensive care in Adassa Hospital in Jerusalem, and another 10 months of recovery procedure in Israel and abroad. I was 94% disabled. You are watching tonight a very expensive officer. Everything here is platinum. <laughs> and really, you cannot see that you are watching now a 60% disabled officer. Because I'm a very good actor. And you won't be able to see what happens here inside. Believe me, it is quite difficult to leave when your backbone is broken. You have a severe head and brain damage. Your teeth are completely broken. Your nerve system is detached from the backbone. The lungs collapsed. The ribs are broken. And more and more and more. It all happened in that ambush. And uh, I struggled for my life. And then I started to struggle to be back in the battlefield. I could not stand the idea that the Islamic Jihad will win this battle. I felt terrible failure. 
How did I let them do that to me? National is personal. How could they succeed at all? I must be back. And when Donna pushed the wheelchair to the recovery department in Tel HaShomer Hospital in Israel, the professor is a well-known professor, expert with recovering soldiers, just uh, took me to the interview. I must show you that at that time I could not hold my body and I looked this way and I could not really control everything. And he asked me in that interview to start the recovery procedure. He asked me, okay, Lieutenant Colonel, I was, that was my rank at the time, what are your goals for the recovery procedure? And sometimes you need a second, a second to crystallize, to clarify exactly what are you living for? Because I was not prepared for this question. And my answer immediately was, Doctor, I want to shoot, to hug, and to write. He was shocked. He said, what do you want? Colonel, you are more than 94% disabled. Do you want to shoot, you say? I said, yes, I want to be able to move this finger. That's all. I want to use the trigger finger. And I must hug my wife and girls. And I must write. And to be able to sign on papers. Well, it was like hell, believe me. But after 10 months, this finger started to move. And I tried it and I understood that I can use my M1 rifle. And I was very, very happy. And I started to struggle and to fight against the doctors that did not want to sign any document that will allow me to be back to the battlefield. There was a general, today he's a Knesset member, General Mufaz. It was the chief of staff. He made the decision and he signed on the paper. He said, okay, you will be full colonel and you'll be brigade commander. And I told him, look, general, I want to serve and to be back to the battlefield, but I want to be back to the area where I was ambushed. They should know that they lose. And I won. So after a year, exactly a year, 22nd of February, I became the brigade commander of Benjamin Regional Brigade the same area, and the Palestinians were sure that I came back to take revenge. I did not. I came and I wanted to be able to use a pen, to be able to sign and write, because I wanted to be able to sign the documents of peace implementation. We were in the middle of peace process, the Oslo process, in the mid-90s. And that's what I did for one year. We made withdrawal after withdrawal. We will speak about withdrawals later on and its prices. And I signed papers, shook hands with my Palestinian partner. And uh, begging him not to force me to retake the areas that I left during these withdrawals according to the peace process. Well, he didn't make it. In September 2000, the war started. Suicide bombers everywhere, ambush along the roads. All the mass populated areas of Israel were under fear. Nobody could walk in the street and be sure that they will be back home safe. Buses exploded. Malls exploded, shops, the economy life in Israel stopped. Normal life disappeared. And after a year and a half, 
when I became J3 and started to plan, I was the chief planner of defensive shield operation, the operation that will take back the West Bank from the Palestinian armed forces because we were, we were under fire and we suffered many casualties, most the civilians. During the time, I was called to the office of the chief of staff and he told me, uh, Colonel, you are going to Australia. And I was in the middle of preparation for a raid that night in a refugee camp in Nablus. He told me, you are going to Australia. And I was not sure whether he is awake. He told me, where am I going to? He told me, there is a mission. And you are going to Australia. You need to speak there and to meet the community and you need to rest as well because the war is continuing. I refused and he made an order. And he also allowed me to bring Donna with me. So that was for me very important. I'm telling that because it was a great experience and my first time to Australia it was seven days of running from place to place. And uh, the most important thing that nine months later, Nir was born, and, it, and many Australians always claim that uh, Nir is actually an Australian girl, and it was because for the first time, Donna and I had time together. So thank you, Australians, for affording that. Just two weeks after I came back from Australia, Defensive Shield Operation was launched and started. And uh, we took back the West Bank and actually could control, they have their own lives, but we can control security. And the economy is back and the normal life is back. And then I could go and be uh, what I always wanted to be, to educate and to build the next generation of leaders for the IDF as the officer training commander school. As mentioned before, I was also the commander of the 91st Division and fought against Hezbollah in the Second Lebanon War. And today, I'm the deputy commander of the Israeli Depth Command. Actually, this is the command that is in charge of doing everything that I cannot speak about at all. Long distance operations, special operation forces, and special forces missions behind the enemy's lines. And we will discuss it later on, what does it mean and why do we need long distance capabilities.